Recording. Welcome back, everybody, to the Attract and Stand Out podcast. I'm your host, Starling Holly, and I am so thrilled to have you here today because I have an amazing guest, Uma Girish, who is a spiritual mentor for women who have experienced deep loss but know there's purpose to their lives. They just don't know what it is or how to live it. Uma guides them to make meaning of their loss so they can live a life of service and joy. Uma is also a Hay House author with two books, and she's been finalist in the Chicago Book Awards, which I can't wait to talk a little bit about your books today, Uma. Um, Uma, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Darlene. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm thrilled to have you here because I know that you support so many amazing women on a, on their journey in life. Just, and like your um, intro said, like helping them find that joy in their life and kind of reconnecting with themselves. So I'm excited to dive into today's conversation and hear a little bit more about your story and how you work with your clients. And then also like how, how business has been sometimes as entrepreneurs, we, we have those ups and downs in business. And so I know that it's so inspiring to hear other people's stories for how they've overcome some of those challenges and what things have really worked for them and what things are like, okay, this didn't work for me. Um, so let's do something else and switch things up a little bit. But before we dive in, um, I have been starting the show with just like a simple check-in. Like, how are you? It's been a wild year and a half at this point. How are you doing? <laughs> You know, it's been a wild roller coaster ride. We relocated from the US to Dusseldorf in Germany in the middle of the pandemic, August of 2020. And it's been challenging because we've been in lockdown for what seems like forever since yeah. uh, October of last year. And we just, Germany just began to open up in June. So I haven't really had a chance to meet too many people or make new friends. I don't know the language. I'm taking German lessons. Yeah. So I've had some really down days um, and some days when we wondered, was this the right time to move? Was this the right move? So there's been all of that. It's been a challenging year. I'll be, I'll be honest about that. Yeah, I can only imagine what it's like. Moving is hard enough when you, when you do it during a normal time of life, but right. going through a pandemic and um, not being able to like just walk into grocery stores or go to like a local pub or coffee shop and connect with people. It's, it's a little right. bit different. Yeah. So I can imagine <laughs> it's been a wild roller coaster. And I'm glad that you guys are opening up because I'm in California and we're recording this at the beginning or middle of June, actually. And we just opened back up literally mm -hmm. yesterday or on Tuesday. So I'm interested to see like what opening back up looks like and what that actually feels like going back out without masks and um, going to concerts again and kind of seeing family and friends that maybe we saw occasionally, but not too much over the past year. Mm -hmm. um, and just kind of seeing what this new normal is. I know for our family, um, life was pretty busy before the pandemic. Um, and I don't like that word busy <laughs> at all. Like I've always <laughs> been somebody who needs a little bit of a slower lifestyle. I don't need to be going nonstop. And it, the pandemic has really allowed us to slow things back down. Mm -hmm. And now that things are coming back opening, I'm like really cautious of my boundaries <clears throat> of what I want to allow back in that maybe we used yeah. to do that we haven't done. So, I, and I know a lot of people have been having that same conversation and like, all right, how do we keep our lives to this, like a little bit slower pace, simpler lifestyle without that constant busy go, go, go. That yeah, you're so right about that because I've had more than one person say to me, um, there's a part of me that's grieving the end of the pandemic. And they say it almost in a whisper because they're so afraid of being judged. And I get that. I get that there's been huge, huge permission to step back and to create more spaciousness, even with you know kids and husband and wife working in the same space, to school in the same room. Um, even so, people have enjoyed not having to commute, not, you know, having legit permission to say no to, you know, obligations and commitments and going out on trips and things like that. And, and that's been wonderful for them. They've been scared to say that out loud and, and secretly they've enjoyed that aspect of the pandemic here and they're afraid it's going to come to an end. Yeah, absolutely. I'm an ambivert. So I have a lot of um, introvertness. And then I have yeah. a, quite a bit of like social butterfly. I like to like be around people and barbecue and entertain and do that stuff. But there's definitely a big piece of my introverted self that has totally loved 
just being home <laughs> and not having a whole lot of things to do oh, yeah. over the past year. So yeah, I can totally see how so many people are like, oh, like it's been kind of nice and quiet. I haven't had to engage with as many people or do yeah, as many activities right. as prior. So yeah, I can, I can see how we could use this time this past year to really like recheck in with ourselves and recommit to the mm-hmm. things that we actually love to do. And say no, like you said, to some of those yeah. things that aren't important to us anymore. I think so, it's yeah. been a learning curve in setting boundaries and negotiating boundaries because our spaces have become so cramped with everyone living and working together. And yeah. now I think we have to learn to extend those boundaries to the outside world, to friends and you know, work colleagues and just determine for ourselves what feels good to take on and what needs to stay out of the circle. Yeah, absolutely. So Uma, I know that you support women who are going, who have gone through some really deep loss in their lives and they kind of mm-hmm. lost their purpose to what they want to do and how they want to show up. How did, how did you start this business and what kind of led you down this path? My path, unlike many people, I'm sure you've interviewed on this podcast, um, was quite different in that I wasn't even looking to create a business. Mm -hmm. No part of me thought to myself, I want to be an entrepreneur. When we moved from uh, India to the US in the spring of 2008, my intention was to come here. Well, not here. I say here, but but I'm in Dusseldorf, Germany. My intention was to come to the States and be um, an ESL teacher, English as a second language because I had taught business English in India as a part-time trainer for the British Council, aside from my freelance writing opportunities. And so I thought as an extension of that, I could just be an ESL tutor. But literally weeks after we moved, my mother in India was diagnosed with stage four cancer and she passed away eight months later. Mm. So we were eight months, eight to 10 months old in a new country. And uh, at the time, the only sibling, the only family I had who was living locally was my brother. And he and I did not have a good relationship at the time. It was a very rocky relationship. Um, You know, it had been rocky for many years prior to my mother's passing. In fact, it was her mother's passing that, my mother's passing that brought us together. And we went on to heal that relationship. But at the time this happened, I felt so alone and didn't know where to turn. It was my first Chicago winter. She died in January of 2009. And what happened was my soul really woke up with her loss. I really began to think about why are we here? Why are we put on this planet? Why do we come here? What am I here to do? Who am I? What is my purpose? And these questions actually were triggered by one specific image that I witnessed when my mother passed away. So in the Indian culture, the body of the deceased person is usually brought home and that's where the last rites happen. So my sisters and I bathed my mother's body. We draped full gold sari on her. We rubbed her cheeks with turmeric paste. We placed a rose garland. It was all part of the ritual that the priest was guiding us on. When all that was done, I stepped back And I had this thought, wow, she is taking her last journey to the crematorium with nothing but the garment that her body is wrapped in. Why do we spend all this time chasing after stuff, acquiring stuff, accumulating stuff? Like, what's this life all about? Clearly, it's not meant for us to have more and more and more stuff. We are meant for something, something more deeper, something different and bigger and that's what got me started on this path of who am I why am I here and what am I here to do my grief was so intense because like I said I was in a new country no friends didn't even know how to drive I learned how to drive in the states and I was in my mid-40s so it was just a, a a loss on so many levels. I wanted to be in India. I wanted to be close to family. I wanted to be in the space that my mother inhabited and I had no access to any of that. So yeah. I started, I would lie awake at night really thinking, where do I go from here? What am I supposed to do? 
And I knew my soul was saying, you have to serve. You have to serve. And I had no idea what that looked like. I mean, service is such a big word. How do you yeah. start? Where do you begin? So at the time, I had a part-time job at a senior living community. And I just decided to throw myself into that job and give it everything I had. Funny thing is, many of the seniors in that retirement community and, and in other retirement communities, um, for sure, they were grieving the loss of a life they knew. They had all been uprooted from familiar neighborhoods, from families, and they had to adjust to this whole new life. So we found similarity. I was adjusting to a new life. I was grieving the death of my mother and the death of the life I knew and was familiar with. And in that, we built a bridge to each other. So they would tell me their story of loss and, and how how different life felt, how difficult it was to navigate it in their 70s and 80s. And that's where I really began. And through a series of clues, which I talk about in more detail uh, in my memoir, Losing Amma, Finding Home, I became a hospice volunteer. I trained to be, become a hospice volunteer. I sat by the bedsides of dying people. I did that for five years. And that was like going to the University of Life. So I, I worked imagine. with the yeah, I worked with the bereavement department. I held space for people who were dying. And then when they died for their family members, I would walk out of this hospice center looking and feeling lit up. My husband was seriously concerned about me and my mental health because at <laughs> home I was really crying a lot, missing my mother. And he said, you should be with happy people and people who are living, not people who are close to death. What's wrong with you? And I said, I don't know how to explain this to you, honey, but I feel lit up when I leave that space. Yeah. I feel like I did something which makes me taking up real estate on the planet worthwhile today. And so that was the beginning of my grief and loss work, which then slowly evolved into me supporting grieving women, women grieving all kinds of losses, not just the death of someone they love, but you know, some, with some women, it was infertility. It was the loss of a dream. It was that they had, they felt like their lives were at a dead end and they didn't know what to do to get the mojo back. Different kinds of losses. And that's what really got me on track with my own purpose. So for me, the big joy is moving women from the portal of pain to the portal of purpose. Yeah, I so love that. And I can completely relate to like the experience that you went through for yourself when you lost your mom and like trying to figure out who you are and what you're supposed to do mm -hmm. after that time. Cause I lost my mom. It'll be um, 20 years on um, this July 4th will be 20 years since I lost my mom in a, in a car accident. And I can remember going through that exact same grieving process. Like you explained, like trying to reconnect with who I am and figuring out like, what is like, what are we doing here? <laughs> what, like, what, yeah. what are we doing in this life? At the time I was um, a single mom to my son was five at the time. And he was actually in the car with my mom and thank goodness I didn't lose him that day as well. But I remember at her service, looking back um, at the sea of people that had come out um, from like the service in the building. And then we walked out to the graveside area. And I remember looking back and there was just so many people that had showed up to like pay their respects and to Re celebrate her life and like remember her and I remember that moment going like there's more to life we have like it's so short we don't know how short it is and how precious it is in the moment when we're just you know I was in my early 20s at the time and I was just you know trying to find my way figure out what I wanted to do in life and I knew I wasn't happy in the work that I was doing and I wanted something more and I remember that like instant that was where I was like okay something's got to change I have to do more I have to I want to have a ripple effect end of the world and leave a yes. legacy for my family, for my kids. Now I have four kids at the time I just had my one son, but mm -hmm. I was like, there's, there's more. And like you said, like we, we take nothing with us and, it, and right. we're in our, in our culture is to like have all the things and keep up with other people and spend all of our money yeah. and, you know, collect all these things. And I'm like, um, yeah. I, I was just joking with my husband the other day. I was like, I feel like the older I'm getting, the less I want of like material stuff. And I'm like, I just want to purge all the things because I'm realizing like, I don't need all this stuff. I don't actually want it. Like I might want it when I'm in the mood, when I'm shopping on Amazon <laughs> and I'm buying that thing, yeah. but within a week or two, I've moved on to something else. So why do we put ourselves mm -hmm. through that? Like constant right. collecting of things and um, 
doing things that don't really serve us in our lives. Yeah, you were talking about your mother's celebration of life and I have no idea how you even navigated that space in your early 20s. So I have so much empathy for you because I was in my mid 40s, which is so much older and I still struggled. Yeah. So I don't know what I would have done if I had been 20 something. Yeah. But the people that came up to me after my mother died and the way they spoke about her and they were these ordinary folk doing ordinary things. Like in India, you know, we have someone to iron our clothes. We have the vegetable vendor who comes home and we have the flower seller who comes home. So all of these very simple, extraordinary people were saying these beautiful, loving things about her. And I thought to myself, what we should really be focused on is creating more love because that's what we leave behind. My mother was live in the memories of these people, in the ways that she touched and impacted their lives. And if only we, could, we spend more time focusing on creating that love, like you said, creating a legacy, that would be so yeah. beautiful instead of, you know, just, just running on the treadmill for what? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> we're totally stagnant. <laughs> yeah. It, and it's so true. So we want to like, I, I always talk about, I, sh I share a lot about my mom um, in my business even because that that moment that I just shared with you guys was the moment for me where I, I started thinking about like, how do I get out of retail management? How do I do something that I love? And that led me on the journey to finding business mm -hmm. coaching um, just a couple of years after I had lost my mom. And I always wonder like, what would have things been like, what would life be like right now had I just stayed because it was easy and it was comfortable and I was good at what I did and I enjoyed the work that I did. I just wasn't like fulfilled by it. Like there wasn't, I wasn't getting yeah. what I wanted from it. But yeah, so, so mm -hmm. often we stay in like that, that hamster wheel where we just kind of stay in the same position, doing the same thing over and over again. And we don't yeah. really explore ourselves and really give ourselves the chance to, to explore love to explore kindness and mm -hmm. that, um, that ripple effect that goes out to support other people. Cause yeah. we're, it's so short. Like life is so short. We have no idea what our life holds, you know, an hour yeah. from now or a couple exactly. of years from now. Yeah. And I, I think it was important to like, to figure out like, what is that legacy? How do we make an impact in the world? And mm -hmm. we all do that in different ways. Each of us is gifted mm -hmm. and these different ways that we can show up and support and like leave that footprint. And so I love that you're supporting women really uncover that footprint for themselves and what that looks like and help them through that grief process. Do you think that that um, process has helped you through that grief process as well as you're supporting the women that you support? It's probably the thing that's helped me the most because anytime I see that glimmer of hope in a client's eyes, where I get to have that, I call it the mountaintop experience because yeah. they are the depths of pain when they come to me, when they find me. And then together we begin this climb up the mountain. Yeah. And I'm sort of like a Sherpa on the journey. I always say to them, I'm not your guru. I'm not your, you know, I'm not a teacher or anything like that. I'm just a guide who's done this before. So I know where the pitfalls are. I know where you'll trip. I know when, when you get tired and need to maybe sit down and, and take a bit of a breather. I know when you need to breathe deeply so you can, you know, fuel yourself for coming up. And then we get to have what I like to call the mountaintop experience, which is they get to have a brand new perspective, a new vista that they're looking at for their life. So it is so fulfilling and so healing to be doing this work because I'm living my purpose when I help these women. And nothing nourishes my soul more than that. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that you said, like, you're, you're not the guru, you're the guide. I was just having a conversation with some colleagues a couple of days ago, and we were talking about storytelling and how we, like, as, as we build these business, our businesses, we, like, share our stories as part of our brand and, like, who we are to yeah. get people to connect with us. And we don't need to be the hero with our clients. Like, I'm a business coach. I, I, try really hard to not put myself ever in that hero position because I'm guiding them. I'm directing them. I'm supporting them. I'm encouraging them and cheering them on, mm -hmm. but I'm definitely not the one showing up and doing the work. They have to be willing to go out there and actually do the work. But I, we, we were talking about how in like the online marketing space right now, there's so many um, 
entrepreneurs who are like the hero of their client's journey. And I'm like, no, like just mm-hmm. you're, you're, it's almost like you're partnering with them. Yeah. You're not, you don't have to like, yeah. like sell, they don't celebrate you. <laughs> they celebrate their wins and their successes. <laughs> right. So, so I, lo- I, yeah. I love that you like come alongside them and guide them on that experience. Yeah. My clients are my peers. I don't like to think of myself on a pedestal. I just yeah. like to think, you know, I've done this before. So I'm someone who can hold space for you while your false self has permission to fall apart and you begin to discover the, the beauty and the uniqueness and the gift of your true self. Yeah. So it's like me saying, I remember who I am. I remember the divine spark that lives in me. And I'm here to remind you that you have that spark within you as well. Mm, the divine spark. I love that. Yeah. Cause we all have it inside of us. Yes, and sometimes yes. it feels like it's dampered or it might be out for mm-hmm. a little while, but mm-hmm. how, like when you're, when you have somebody like you who can come alongside and guide and support, like that light can start to come back. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Because it's all about, it's all about polishing the mirror, right? So when, when someone is grieving and they look at their reflection in a mirror, it's usually, you know, there's a lot of, you know, it's, it's foggy, um, it's stained, it's unclean, it's dirty, and they're seeing a distorted version of themselves. My job is to help them clean the mirror, you know, square yeah. inch by square inch, so that once we're finished, they, they love who they're looking at and they begin to see the light reflected mm-hmm. back to them. That's beautiful. Yeah. And so many women look in that mirror and they judge and they put themselves yeah. down and they yeah. have imposter syndrome or they, you know, find all the flaws they think they have mm-hmm. and they don't take that time to polish it and really yes. um, f- fall in love with the woman that they are and who they're, yeah. who they are and who they're meant to be in this lifetime, mm-hmm. in this world. So I love yes. that you guide them on that journey. As you have started your business, since you kind of, like you didn't really plan to fall into entrepreneurship, what have been some of the biggest obstacles that you feel like you've had to uncover for yourself as you've started a business and really Mm. put yourself out there with visibility and all of those pieces? So two things come to mind. One is I believed for a, a, a fair length of time that I had to do everything in order to be successful. I had to learn how to do the, you know, but back then it was, I think, um, teleseminars when when I started my business. I had to learn how to host teleseminars. I had to learn how to do one-on-one coaching. I had to learn how to create packages. I had to learn how to host webinars, like courses, everything. And I was trying to do bits and pieces of everything and not doing anything really well. And as you probably know, Make It Work Online, Jenny She's program is the was the first program that gave me that clear roadmap on how I'm meant to show up as a heart-centered entrepreneur and yeah. how I need to you know, go inside and figure out what my strengths are. You know, I want to be visible. What are some fun ways for me to be sharing my message? And that changed everything for me. So definitely that was one obstacle, trying to do everything in bits and pieces. The second uh, really powerful obstacle, I would say, is the fact that, you know, I believed for a, for a long time, and this is probably cultural messaging, family messaging, that spiritual mentoring or, you know, doing this kind of spiritual work, because I essentially use spiritual soul-centered tools to help my people, um, and receiving money cannot coexist. So it's like, I'm doing this deeply spiritual, holy, sacred work. How dare I charge money for it? So in the, in the beginning stages of my business, that was something I really had to work through and embrace that the divine lives in money as well. The divine is present in everything and, everything and everywhere. So how can money be wrong? Money is also divine energy. And I fully deserve to be compensated and adequately compensated for putting my energy, giving my time out there. Because here's the thing, when I sit with a client for 60 minutes or I'm facilitating a group program for 60 minutes, that's 60 minutes of the time allotted to me 
in this human life. Yeah. We don't often think about it like that. But those 60 minutes are gone. They will never come back to me. What better gift am I giving anybody? What else do I have to do to prove my worthiness or value? I'm committing 60 minutes of everything I've got, my breath, my being, my knowledge, my wisdom and skills to facilitate this session. How can it be wrong for me to be compensated for that time and energy and that breath? Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up because I see that with almost every single client that I work with. They're like, they have almost this like little bit of guilt in themselves because they're like, well, I'm helping people and I'm showing up and I'm serving. And I like most, most of my clients tend to be like helpers or healers in some kind of way. And they feel like it's part of their calling. Right. And, and we, we put that pressure on ourselves. We're like, oh, maybe I shouldn't get paid to do this because you know, it's my calling and I'm, I'm just serving and helping other people. But I love that you like reframe that for yourself and really put it in a way that like the restructure of like, you're spending 60 minutes of your time, your energy, you're putting that energy into somebody else and that you're worthy of um, the income that comes with that as well. Such an important, important piece to always um, come back to because especially women, (laughs) we put ourselves last, we do for everybody else. And then we, you know, we get the scrubby scraps that are left over for ourselves at the end of the day. And it's so powerful when you can do work that you love and show up and serve in such a beautiful way and provide for your family and donate back to your community and volunteer your time at hospice and different things like that when you Mm -hmm. like, because you want to, and that money thrive or that money brings the ability for women to actually do the things that they love and support their community and their family your way. Right. Money needs to be in circulation. If money is not in circulation, that's when your energy becomes stagnant and clients don't show up, your work doesn't go well. So you need to be able to receive money and you need to be able to invest that money in things that uplift you, inspire you. Because yeah. most times it's he- the healers and people who do this kind of heart-centered work are highly sensitive people. They are empaths. So I'm an empath. And if I don't look after my body and if I don't look after my, my me time, if I'm not conscious about that guardrail, I could get easily drained. And then I don't have the energy to give to the people who need my work. So I'm doing everybody out there disservice by denying myself the massage, the the trip to, you know, a fancy resort, a lovely meal with a friend. These are the experiences that energize me. They fill my fuel tank and that's so necessary. So how can I, how can it be wrong for me to receive money? for that. Yeah. And it's not wrong. So I love that you brought that up today. (laughs) Like I I always, I I use a mantra, like money flows freely to me is one of the mantras that I, that I say to myself when I feel myself like getting stuck (laughs) or being, you know, not wanting to ask for the sale or when I know that it's time to go out there and do some more marketing to get another client. I always tell myself like money flows freely to me. And then when money comes in, I always like re say that phrase to myself and I'm like, Oh yeah, it does. Money does flow freely to me and it flows away from me in ways that I can give back and support my family and my adventures. Exactly. And like you said, meals and travels and all yeah. those things It money makes the world go around and it's okay for us to accept it and bring it in. Right. And when you I- invest money in yourself, so you're taking a course or you're you know, buying a, a, a set of books that you want to read. Everything that you invest in yourself, you will give to the people that you're meant to serve. Yes. So it can never be wrong. You also have to, you know, so many people make the mistake of I'll receive the money, but then I'm not going to invest in a coaching program that's a little too expensive or, you know, a healing modality. You have to be discerning. Of course, that's very important. But I think it's very important to invest money in yourself because everything you pour into you, you pour into the people you serve. Yes, yes, I completely agree. And it's one of those things like you have to be able to, if you have to be willing to put yourself out there and be willing to invest yourself for you to to receive those things back as well. It's like that exchange of energy that comes back and forth with it. So I love that. Correct. I'm curious, what is your definition of success for you and your business? Mm, Such a good question. So for me, um, and this has been my definition the last maybe 10 to 12 years since my mother died, my whole definition of success as 
you have to achieve and you have to set goals and get to them and surpass them and be the best at what you do. Or that whole definition fell apart. That just fell away from my life. So today, success for me looks like doing deeply fulfilling work in order to create a difference in other people's lives and being adequately and richly compensated for it. Mm, yeah, I love that. Such a beautiful definition of success. Uma, what, what's mm. next for you? What's coming up next for you in your business? Like what are some of your goals or things that you're gonna be working on over the next few months? So I, all, I like to say, and this is something I teach my clients that, you know, for a purpose, also evolves because nothing in this universe is stagnant energy, right? Everything, all energy is changing, growing, transmuting, expanding. So just as we humans having, you know, divine beings having a human experience are constantly evolving and expanding, our purpose also expands. So in this season of my purpose and its expression, I am facilitating two programs. We just got one started. It's called the Soul Purpose Sisterhood. And there are links to all of that on my website, on my work with me page. Uh, and that program is for women who've experienced a deep loss, but know that there's a deeper purpose to their lives. So I guide them on that journey from, you know, I'm broken, I'm in pain. I, I haven't recovered from a loss that happened maybe 10 years ago or 10 days ago. And then they move through the whole journey, six month journey to get to, you know, what is my purpose? What's the dream I want to create for myself and the world? The program that's coming up in August um, is called Sacred Soul Union. And this is the new expression of my purpose. It's a program that is for awakened women who find themselves walking a soul path because of some transformation that, that has happened in their lives, but who are in long-term marriages where their spouses don't get their journey. So they are unable to have the conversations that they want to have. Um, they oftentimes play small because their spouse doesn't um, validate their journey. I mean, something that you don't even understand, you cannot validate. So there's yeah. the grief of that relationship dynamic changing in the marriage. So the, the woman is walking one path and the man is walking another. And oftentimes it is just maybe the children who are holding the marriage together or the, the, the fact that she needs financial support or she's afraid to break the relationship for fear of what the family will say, what society will say, that kind of thing. And up until this point, divorce has been the only exit door that's, that's available. In my program, I teach you to honor the separate journey you're walking. So you and he can continue to be married, but what creates the difficulty or the stress or the suffering is the fact that you want him to be on your path. And in this program, I teach you how to honor your journey and how to honor his journey. And we just wrapped up one edition of this program and the women in that program are already seeing shifts, amazing shifts in their marriage. So I'm so excited to, you know, yeah. um, open up the next round of the program in August. That is so exciting. And I love that you're bringing, like, I love how you explained it to you. Like you're not shit, like saying like, well, here's the door. <laughs> it's more of yeah. like, it's okay to have your journey and yes, like his and her journeys or her, like your spouse having separate journeys along that way exactly. and not feeling like you have to be on the exact same path together, because that's definitely a conversation that I hear women talk about all the time is like, they, yes. they're trying to change their spouse or they try to get them to come over to their side. And there's definitely one thing that I've learned in my, in my marriage, especially is you can't change somebody else. They have to want to be, no. they have to change for themselves. And we put so much on that relationship being like one path, but yeah, you can still be yeah. together and have like your separate pieces that you enjoy as well with that. So I love that you're supporting women and really uncovering what that looks like for them so they can move forward and still have a healthy relationship, but still show up and do the work that they love that they're put here on this earth to do. Yeah, this has been my journey. And uh, my husband and I celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary yeah. last month. So Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So it's been, it's been my own growth path. And so I've taken everything that I have used in my own journey and I've turned it into teaching this in, in a format for women who come into this program. And it's just been such fulfilling work. Yeah. Different I, I, kind I, of grief and loss, but you know, 
Yeah. It gets to a place where the dynamic in the marriage shifts because when you shift your energy, your partner has to learn to do a different dance. You don't do it by forcing him to change. You just do it by focusing on your path and becoming more of who you are. And instead of seeking love from your partner, you begin to recognize that you are love. You are mm. complete and whole. Yeah. Yeah. You are love. I love that. Uma, this has been so fun having you on the show and just hearing your story and um, how you've come to the place that you are on your path today. Thank you for sharing so much. I would love to, to dive into like what I call like a rapid fire um, session. Um, just a couple of questions to kind of get to know you a little bit better. Um, I'm curious, who has made the biggest impact in your life? If you had to say one person who comes to mind as like that first person that's really made a, a huge impact in your world. Oprah Winfrey. Yes. Why? What, what is it about Oprah? I just love her energy, her sense of humor, her desire to serve and influence and impact, you know, millions of people. Um, yeah. I learned so much about intention from her. And I just love everything that she stands for. So yeah. I, I love Oprah. I mean, I know there are lots of people who don't, but you know, I stand by. I'm on a, I'm, I'm on the Oprah bit bandwagon. I love Oprah too. Okay. She's, she's made such a big impact in the world. And mm. she definitely um, has shown up as herself and really just given yes. from her whole heart. And I love that when women, especially when women can, women of color can stand up and um, yes. really own their space and le like lead, lead a path for others to follow as well. It's such an important mm -hmm. piece to our world. All right, so are you binge watching anything right now? <laughs> I am, I'm watching the silliest show on Netflix called Pretty Little Liars. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's so, it's crazy, but I don't know. I just got hooked and I'm, I'm watching that like there's no tomorrow. I love it. Yeah. It's, it's funny how some of those shows, um, I like to call them like the teeny bopper shows because I still feel yeah. like they're, it was like, they're like teenage shows probably, but I love those <laughs> too. So I can totally relate. And I've, I think I've seen most of that series at some point. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's awesome. We are just watching Sweet Tooth, which is like brand new on Netflix. And that's a pretty cute show oh. as well. Okay. So I, I love asking what people are watching because I found, especially mm. over the past year, year and a half, more people are binge watching things than ever yes. before. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Jane the Virgin was my favorite, you know, binge watch in 2020. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That's a good one as well. <laughs> I love it. It is. And what, yeah. what are you currently reading? Do you have a book on your nightstand? Uh, what am I currently reading? I'm actually reading Jack Fisher's book and loving it. The Unfussy Life. Unfussy Life. Yeah. Awesome. I just finished. So that's the one I'm reading right now. Awesome. <laughs> okay. I love her memoir. It's a great book. Great addition. <laughs> and there's nothing better than living yes. an unfussy life, right? Like there's no need to make it super complicated. Exactly. Right. Awesome. Right. And what is your happy place when you need to reset and recharge? Um, is there a thing that you like to do or a place that you like to go to like reconnect with yourself? Um, I close my eyes and I go to this beautiful little cottage I created in my mind, in my imagination. That's sort of my imaginal space. It's in a forest. There's a hammock outside. There's a stack of books. It's really small and cozy. It has a hot mug of tea over there and scented candles. It's just the most beautiful place. So I close my eyes and just take myself back there. Um, and sometimes I'll invite my higher self to come and have a conversation with me. So I see myself sitting in a chair and I'll invite my higher self to sit in the chair across from me and ask her a question about something I'm struggling with or feeling confused about. And always makes me feel good when I go to that yeah. space. I love that. I love that you can go there anytime as well. It's not like you have yes. to go somewhere specific or do something special. You can just check in with yourself right. and close your eyes yeah. and breathe and take yourself yeah to your, yeah. your fun little cottage. I love that. And my last question for you today, if I could buy you a plane ticket and you could go anywhere in the world, where would you go and why? Uh, Hawaii. Mm. It's, it's been on my bucket list forever. And we finally thought we'd, we'd go from California when everything shut down because of COVID. Yeah. So we weren't able to make it, but I really, really want to go to Maui. Yes, Maui's actually so on my anyone, list. Yeah, so if anyone listening has a contact, 
you need some a speaker, a teacher, a workshop facilitator, reach out to me. <laughs> right. And I'll go with you and we'll just take over yeah. the stage. <laughs> you're such a pro at uh, handling, you know, you're such a pro at putting together these events. Oh my goodness, Darlene. It would be a, an Thank honor you. to have you. It would be super fun for sure. Um, Hawaii is a magical place. I went, gosh, it's probably been like 13 years now since I had gone and we went to Kauai. Mm -hmm. And I remember we went up for 11 days. And I remember thinking before we left, like 11 days is going to be too long. I've never, I've, I had, at that point in my life, I had never taken a vacation that long. And I thought for sure we'd be bored and ready to come home. And I laugh now because after the 11 days, I was like, we're going home and selling everything. And we're going to come open up a hot dog or a lemonade stand on the beach. And we're just going to have like the clothes on our back. And I love like the simpleness and like how slow everything was over there. And mm, it was just yes. beautiful. And you could go on hikes and you can go snorkeling and you can sit on the beach and just soak up some sun. Yeah. I'm like, this is the life. <laughs> so I could absolutely go back over there. Yeah. And actually Maui's um, next on my list when um, my grandparents used to go to Maui every couple of years when I was a kid and they, mm -hmm. my grandma was like, I'm taking you to Maui. And unfortunately um, I lost her when I was 18 and we never got to go on that trip, but it's still in my head. And I always think about like, it would be so special to go back and, or to go, even though she can't go with me and just, you know, have that moment and kind of maybe go in some of the places she has, had visited. Um, I need to like mm -hmm. figure out where she went though. Cause I don't know where she went. I'm like, I need to find pictures or something <laughs> that she has. I have boxes of photos up in the closet from my grandparents' house. And I'm like, maybe there'll be some evidence in here. <laughs> but, <laughs> Uma, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been such an honor to hear your story. I know people are going to want to connect with you and learn more about these amazing programs and how you work with women. Um, where do they go? Where do you, where do you like to hang out? I love to hang out on Instagram. So you can find me um, at Uma Mentor. That's my handle, U-M-A Mentor, M-E-N-T-O-R. You can also go to my website, which is umagirish.com, U-M-A-G-I-R-I-S-H.com. Beautiful. And I know you have a free gift for everybody listening today. Can you tell us a little bit about it? And I'll make sure that the links are below in the show notes. I actually have a, a free... Um, gift goodie bag for, for our listeners. There's a couple of different um, gift options. So if you click the link, you can just decide what you want for a free gift and then, and then get it. So there's, okay. there's a PDF on, you know, the 10 things that your soul wants to know, wants you to know. Um, there's another one. I, I'm not going to give it away. So I'm going to just leave you to go and find the, find the link, click on the Think you'll see three to four free gifts and you can pick the one that you want or you can have all four of them that's that's fine too perfect love all the gifts it's like you're kind of being like oprah right? <laughs> then you get a gift yeah, there you go. <laughs> like a, it's like a grab bag of gifts i love it yes. absolutely so yes. go check out um what uma has on her website devour all of her content because as you can tell she has a beautiful heart and she is here to serve and support and encourage and motivate and help you um do it all, like whatever your dreams are, help you get to what you need, especially if you've gone through um, a lot of life stuff and you thought that maybe they couldn't, you couldn't get there. Um, Uma is definitely the gal to support you on that journey. So Uma, thank you so much for being here. And thank you so much for this opportunity. It was such a fun conversation. You asked some really good questions. I'm, I'm so grateful. Yeah. Thank you so much. And um, if you enjoyed this episode, um, hit subscribe and leave a review. I would your support um, with the show definitely uh, makes a huge impact in everything that I do and the way that I show up each week. So um, I will see you next week. Um, don't forget, I believe in you. You're allowed to stand out. You're allowed to shine. You're allowed to be you. We'll see you next week. Bye.